Hello, everyone. Uh, it's 11 10, I think we'll start. Uh, my name is Bill Michaud from the University of Illinois. My colleague, uh, Alessandro Cabada, could not be here today. Um, so I'm doing both parts of this presentation. It's actually, the presentation is actually, uh, the slide deck is an uh, amalgamation of two different presentations, one on um, uh, uh, sort of informational about uh, machine learning, and then the other on uh, our practices. I'm gonna focus more on the second part, which is really our, our practices. Um, this is really a work in progress, um, maybe a, a snapshot of a process. Uh, some uh, erred in the side of putting in a lot of slides uh, for background, so you can refer to some of these later. Uh, first, I think it's uh, useful for us to do an uh, environmental scan. Um, in our case, we emphasize the fact that we have tools that uh, we can use to implement interconnected services. Uh, these include uh, things like uh, robust APIs, uh, DOIs as glue that uh, uh, al allow uh, connectivity, interconnectivity, um, asynchronous GPU parallel processing, <clears throat> and for the most part, open data sets that can provide data and content. So the question here is, or the hope is that we can use machine learning uh, computational tools uh, to add to the uh, our armamentarium in terms of what we can use for system development. If you look at uh, machine language and AI and library services, um, what we want to do is focus on uh, using systems and services and service frameworks that provide the scaffolding for these interconnected services. Uh, for example, in our Bento style uh, discovery system, uh, we sometimes are doing 14 to 16 uh, asynchronous API calls in order to retrieve results. Um, that scaffolding and that interconnectivity is extremely important. Uh, so we want to look at uh, machine learning in, in all these different systems and see where they can apply. Uh, this whole thing really began with a, a question, uh, which was, can we add a topic modeling component to our API-based bibliographic database service? And uh, as an extension, what about adding it, uh, adding uh, uh, ML to uh, bibliometric and discovery and delivery services? More deep background. So uh, machine learning, um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, uh, takes sets of observations, identifies patterns and anomalies. Um, pattern recognition is really the heart of uh, any machine learning algorithm. Uh, machine learning uh, uh, uses a mathematical model uh, in fact, all machine learning is numbers, so uh, uh, documents, for example, to be vectorized. Our focus is on document clustering. We want to try to identify key concepts from a corpus of documents, uh, devise a way to partition the corpus into groups of related documents. Uh, what we've done is develop some tools to extract words and phrases um, and uh, build uh, systems that can be presented to the clustering software. More background. Um, our clustering is unsupervised, unsupervised machine learning versus text classification, which is supervised. Supervised uh, learning uses a uh, predefined set of training data uh, so that you've already pre-assigned uh, 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 documents into one of uh, pre-established classes. Again, all uh, machine learning is numerical, so uh, vectorization is, uh, is done on everything, and uh, you're doing the, uh, that in order to use uh, some similarity or distance measures to find related documents. Uh, in the work we're doing, we're using the cosine function, but there's a, 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 a dot matrix function, a linear algebra function, and, and uh, also Euclidean uh, distance that's sometimes used. Most clustering uses what's called a bag of word approach uh, versus uh, text as phrases, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, certainly explainability, reproducibility are critical in all uh, ML uh, projects. Um, and an important point, uh, a lot of projects actually, are, uh, time is spent on processing, cleaning, and preparation of data. Uh, that's integral to any uh, successful project. So, uh, 
we looked at a number of off-the-shelf clustering environments uh, with the idea that we we're going to determine if any of them were really ready to be used literally off the shelf. Um, I've got a list here of some of the things we looked at. We've been focusing a lot on Scikit-Learn, uh, the Microsoft Azure Cognitive uh, uh, Services Toolkit, uh, the Google platform, uh, Wolfram Mathematica. Uh, some of the other ones are not being used as much. Uh, Amazon Comprehend, we've had a project or two we did with that. Uh, we try to test a lot of these different uh, systems. We also try to test uh, particular algorithms, K-means, K-means plus, uh, LDA, um, spectral clustering for phrases. It turns out that the choice of the initial clusters is important within any uh, uh, machine learning clustering algorithm. Uh, supervised algorithms and classification algorithms uh, uh, you use a number of different uh, uh, different techniques, and then uh, regression is also an unsupervised uh, activity. Uh, one of the things that you see in the literature is that people are using a lot of different algorithms. Uh, sometimes people try multiple algorithms to see what fits uh, the data best. That's actually one of the issues in terms of, uh, of uh, machine learning. So a lot's been done already on machine learning in libraries. We've... Uh, 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 Notre Dame had an IMLS grant a couple of years ago to, to look at topic modeling in uh, uh, discovery systems or in library discovery. Library of Congress has done a lot of work and they had a, a, a number of, uh, of uh, seminars and uh, conferences. Notre Dame has actually released a, a set of papers done on machine learning in libraries, and I, that, which is what I'm linked to here. Uh, there's also an uh, Idea Institute on AI, which is IMLS funded. Uh, which I've been involved with. Um, overall, uh, there's a feeling that, as uh, uh, Ryan Cordell's report from a commission by LLC indicated, that libraries could become really focal sites for the uh, translation and collaboration that would be required to cultivate responsible machine learning. But for a lot of other people, machine learning is kind of like the law of the hammer. Uh, you give a child a hammer and suddenly everything needs pounding. Um, it, it is important to pause and consider if uh, AI techniques are the best approach before trying to use them. Um, real quickly, a lot of hype and hope already for machine learning. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, uh, references here, uh, a couple of examples of positive machine learning uh, uh, projects, including the Library of Congress, uh, and particularly some in uh, uh, medical AI, uh, and then uh, some projects that did not work out, for example, the Google flu trends, uh, some of the AI and radiology uh, uh, problems. We're still at a very early stage on all of these. And uh, it, it's clear that real life experience with clustering uh, within libraries and elsewhere uh, still shows that there are some real issues. One of the terms that's being used now is augmented intelligence to sort of describe the uh, interface between the human component and the machine learning. Uh, a couple of other uh, slides here, issues with AI. Uh, it's a very famous uh, column in science uh, uh, where the uh, AI uh, people themselves are questioning the value of what they're doing and, wh and how it's being done. A uh, number of clustering comments uh, uh, taken from some of the literature. Uh, uh, typically, uh, or specifically, uh, topic modeling and, uh, with clustering techniques still has a lot of issues and uh, a lot of questions. So I'll talk a little bit about what we've been doing. We have a service that, uh, a database service where, for example, uh, we provide access to uh, 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 articles on a topic using the Scopus API. <clears throat> this particular project is a, a database where we downloaded 57,000 articles <clears throat> from uh, Scopus API on biofuels and worked with a couple of faculty members in uh, civil engineering uh, to do topic modeling on these. They wanted specifically to look at these articles and say what are the research fronts, what are the hot topics in this area. 
We used a couple of the clustering techniques. We settled on a technique that was, it's actually called comparative text mining CTM. Uh, we had a computer science faculty member who we uh, consulted with who had worked on this project and eventually ended up publishing the article here in the journal called Renewable and Sustainable Energy Reviews. Um, the K-means biofuels uh, analysis revealed uh, seven clusters, I'm sorry, eight clusters. Uh, again, because K-means is a bag of words approach, you get individual words and you have to try to interpret those individual words uh, uh, within the uh, uh, topic clusters. The CTM results uh, actually allowed us to do some more phrase uh, generation and uh, that produced uh, 12 clusters. Um, and I've got some of these listed here, low emission diesel, uh, fuel cells, et cetera. Um, the clusters were all uh, analyzed with the K-means cluster uh, and we uh, derived uh, uh, six topics of, of uh, interest for this uh, particular article. So, um, uh, the, the other project we've been working on with, uh, uh, extensively with uh, uh, clustering techniques is our research impact visualizations. We've uh, put together a, a database of 500 faculty research impact indicators uh, from nine different departments in engineering and physical sciences and a database of metadata over 10 years of publication. So the visualizations themselves this is of the Cancer Center of Illinois uh, indicate the number of publications a particular faculty member has generated, uh, the times they've been cited, the number of uh, co-authors, the uh, number of grants received. This is a research impact uh, indicator service, a research impact service. But we have all this data and we can use this for uh, correlation of different impacts or different indicators. So we can ask if the per people that publish the most articles also have the most grants, uh, also have the most, uh, uh, have been the most cited. Uh, we can look at the uh, data we've collected in clustering and try to identify, again, research fronts or uh, research areas for, uh, within each department or more interestingly across departments. So the Cancer Center topic extraction yields uh, this sort of K-means analysis, uh, individual terms, uh, again, a key point is that uh, there's often a need for domain knowledge or uh, domain experts, disciplinary experts, to look at these uh, clustering uh, results and uh, turn them into something that's useful, uh, phrases and uh, particular terms. So if you look at uh, um, uh, cluster four optical coherence tomography, cluster four in the original K-means, or individual words, and you have to derive the, the semantic meaning of those. So we've been looking a lot at uh, clustering examples that use uh, phrases rather than bag of words. So uh, there are a couple of different techniques that are available, and our assumption is that using phrases instead of words should better capture semantic meaning uh, of the documents and help us do better uh, topic modeling. That turns out to be somewhat true. Uh, we've been looking at a couple of different uh, clustering techniques. One is called kernel k-means. One is called spectral clustering. Uh, to test this, I've taken or generated a sample discovery set of 455 documents or 435 documents uh, from the Scopus API that I understand uh, because they're about library discovery systems and put together specific phrase indexes uh, we've been using uh, one of the Microsoft Cognitive Services tools to generate the uh, um, uh, phrases. So you see on the left-hand side, abstract, and the phrase is derived on the right-hand side using the Microsoft tool. Um, ran these through our uh, scikit-learn, uh, k-means, the spectral clustering that was not successful, uh, used the uh, Wolfram spectral clustering tool, which actually did break the uh, corpus nicely into four different clusters. And you can see here the uh, results you get back from Wolfram. Again, the results you get back from any of these systems are problematical in the sense that you have to interpret them. 
So the Wolfram system gives back uh, the documents that are in each uh, different cluster, but then you have to characterize those documents by uh, deriving keywords and looking at the term frequencies. So again, here under the wood, vectorizing. Uh, if, you, if you look at the discovery set, the total number of words are 72,000. There's 7,337 unique words, but actually 9,711 unique phrases. So actually the phrase uh, uh, der derivation uh, yielded more, uh, more elements. We're using, uh, again, some of these similarities or closest measures. This is the uh, uh, cosine value. There's a number of other techniques uh, or issues con uh, involved with vectorizing. One is dimensionality reduction, which is really linear algebra techniques. Um, I've had the uh, uh, privilege here of digging out my old linear algebra book from when I was a math major and trying to figure out uh, some of these uh, techniques that are being used in uh, this clustering uh, models. Um, so there's a question here about clustering versus classification. Can we actually do a real good topic modeling uh, without uh, uh, our initial classification of a few articles? Uh, this slide I know you won't be able to read shows how we, we're building the uh, word indexes, the phrase indexes. And then if you look in the center section on the comparing two documents, uh, you'll see that uh, these values, which are between zero and one, don't differ by much. And if you start looking at uh, uh, comparing all the values in the corpus of a small number of sets, for example, just the uh, 430 documents, it's 92,000 initial comparisons. So this is a lot of machine processing and a lot of machine time. So uh, we've learned a lot of, uh, from the, our experience with the uh, clustering algorithms. Um, one of the things I think that's an interesting question is, uh, can we use what we've already learned uh, in IR systems, for example, uh, uh, using inverted file structures, um, uh, 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 proximity searching, field limiting? Can any of these uh, techniques be passed into the uh, machine learning environment? Um, uh, can this be our contribution? Can uh, our augmented uh, in, uh, intelligence uh, application here be uh, adapting into some of these ML algorithms? Uh, the uh, experiences and the knowledge we've already gained from uh, uh, information retrieval systems. And as Cliff mentioned in, the, uh, in his plenary, we need to see a generation of tools that will open this up, make this all easier to use. And as information professionals, uh, we have a role that we can play here. All right, um, let's stop here. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions. Uh, anybody needs ask questions, have to come up to the front. Or if you just want to shout the question out. Tom, how are you? Yeah. Uh, um, there you go. Oh, the um, you may have mentioned this, but there's, we have done some experimentation on full text versus just bibliographic records. Have oh. you found that just bibliographic records has yielded anything useful? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, which I should have made. Uh, a lot of this analysis you do see is on full text. Again, I think here is where you end up with the uh, not knowing what we already know. I mean, we've learned an awful lot about uh, uh, full text searching. Proximity searching, looking for words within the same paragraph, within the same uh, sentence. Uh, one of the sort of fundamentals that we learned with IBM stairs and uh, systems like BRS is that it's important to be able to do uh, searching within paragraphs, within sentences. Uh, when you load up the full text in a um, machine learning system, you've lost all of that. So uh, that becomes a real problem. Um, because of convenience, we're using the uh, metadata. We're using abstracts and, and, and title words. Um, we haven't actually looked at the difference between that and full text, but when I look at the literature, uh, the, the, you know, there's huge processing times and computational issues with, with uh, 
doing uh, comparisons with full text words. Remember, you're building these huge vectors. Uh, one of the vectors is your, essentially your, your dictionary, your universe of terms. So it's an n by d vector where the d value is the total number of terms. Any other uh, questions? Um, the, the slides will be available, so uh, uh, please feel free to contact me. So you're... Um, I'm punting on your last question, yeah. What's that? No, that was great. Uh, follow up, if I may. Sure. Um, so it sounds like abstracts are key. Have you found a difference between abs uh, metadata without abstracts versus metadata including the abstract? Yes, yes. The abstracts are, are, are extremely important. Um, Title words are trying to outguess an author, so uh, they're not always descriptive, and sometimes uh, we've all seen the sort of cute titles of articles. Um, so the abstracts, I think, in, in terms of document description, uh, are extremely important. And it, it, it's a uh, substitute, really, for the, for the full text processing, which does take an awful lot of computational time. So this is a, a, a extremely important area. It's going to be very fruitful. We're going to see a lot of work in the, in the next couple of years on this. And um, uh, we're looking forward to making some inroads and putting together some insights about how uh, we can use machine learning in library applications. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you for your time.